country. He has published about 200 journal and conference papers and several book chapters on these topics. He was an editor for the journal Algorithmica, an international journal on foundations of computer science and a problem editor for ACM transactions on algorithms. We are honored to have him here to give this talk. So before we begin, just a note for the audience. Uh, please feel free to put down your questions in the chat box and professor will answer them at the end of the talk. Alternatively, you can raise your hand and I'll recognize you. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, professor. Thank you so much. If you want to interrupt and ask the questions that are in the chat, that's fine. I'm not monitoring the chat. I, I'm not seeing the chat right now in my display. So thanks everyone uh, for taking your evenings to join me for the lecture today. So uh, this is actually a pretty old project. Uh, it's more than 10 years old to some degree, uh, but I've been gone back to working on it lately and I'll talk a little bit about the more recent work. Uh, so this was uh, a joint work that started in like 2010 or 11 with two of my PhD, then PhD students, Jessica Chang and Koel Mukherjee. So Jessica finished her PhD in 2013, it's now Department of Defense. And Koel has uh, moved around quite a bit. Uh, she was at uh, Xerox Research in Bangalore, then she was at IBM Research, and now she's currently at Adobe Labs in Bangalore. Uh, so this project was kind of started off in collaboration with them, like I said, about over a decade ago. So the main uh, reason why we began to look at some scheduling problems uh, was because of a high use of data centers uh, starting going back 20 years. So data centers uh, consume an immense amount of power. And so we were kind of interested in uh, looking at classical scheduling problems that have been studied for decades. I mean, scheduling literature goes back to the 50s. Um, and uh, we wanted to sort of think about it from a power energy aspect. And uh, this particular quote from a report from Intel caught our attention that power aware job scheduling really was tuned to optimize performance. So everybody was focused on performance and not on the energy cost of different schedules. So uh, we began to think about uh, both uh, challenges in a data center world as well as a physical world where, uh, so this is a very an illustrative example of a, of a ship. So we think about container ships that uh, transport large number of objects. You might have a situation where a container is ready to leave um, uh, a port and then the, there's a deadline when the container is expected in some other location. So the ship has to schedule a trip, right? And then there could be other containers that also need to uh, be delivered, and then they have a different release time when the container is available for shipping. And of course, you can sort of ask the question, uh, when should I schedule the ship? If I schedule the ship as soon as the first container is available, then I have to send the second container on a different ship potentially. But if I could delay the first container and schedule the ship only once after the second container is available, then perhaps both the containers can be carried together in one trip. So the cost could be like one trip versus two trips, right? And you can think of this in many applications, uh, in most cities, there are shuttles that run from the airport to downtown. And in some sense, passengers are continuously arriving and then the, air, uh, the operator has to decide when to dispatch a shuttle. So you can, of course, dispatch a shuttle for every passenger separately, but then that uh, would be a very expensive way of running the business because it would involve many, many trips. But of course, the customers will be happy because their waiting time will be very low. At the same time, you can wait for shuttles to fill up, right? So that basically leads to an interesting optimization question as to given a vehicle with a certain capacity and uh, requests arriving to use the vehicle, uh, how should you do the grouping, right? And the vehicle also has a capacity, so you cannot put everybody on the same shuttle. So in this case, the number of containers that you can take carry in one trip is bounded, or in the case of a shuttle, it might carry 10 passengers, something like that, okay? So this is sort of the motivation uh, that we had. Now, Notice that uh, ovens uh, and trucks operate slightly differently. So what I mean by the following is in a, in, a, in a ship model or a truck model, I'm using those terms interchangeably, there's simply a, a, a batching, synchronized batching model, right? So by synchronized batching, I mean, uh, I can schedule one job or two jobs, but in the next trip, uh, the, the, these are completely disjoint uh, trips. So there's no overlap between them. If you think about a pizza oven where something is baking, I can slide one pizza into the oven at time zero. And at time one, I can add a second pizza to the oven. So that second pizza goes in. And at time two, when the first pizza comes out, then a third pizza can be 
use the spot, right? So the batch capacity in this case is two. So the oven can bake two pizzas at a time. So the model is not synchronized, right? So in also like this is closer to modeling like uh, computer operations where you might have a multi-core processor which can has a certain number of threads and maybe each of these threads can be doing something different. And when one thread becomes idle, maybe some other process can be started there. So it doesn't have to be synchronized. So I just wanted to point out that while the tools that we develop are we fo mostly focused on the shipping model or the trucking model, uh, the techniques are actually fairly similar in, in for both of these uh, problems. So the focus of this talk is mainly on offline algorithms. So we will assume that the entire input is available to us in advance. We know what the jobs are that we're trying to schedule. And then we want to come up with algorithms uh, to come up with an efficient schedule. So we published a, a number of papers. Uh, some of these papers actually did address online algorithms as well. Uh, but the main focus that I, of today's talk is on the paper that I mentioned uh, published in 2014, uh, listed in red. And then I'll briefly mention some follow-up work done by Saurabh Kumar and myself, which was a paper in the Symposium on Parallel Algorithms and Architectures, the same conference that carried the 2014 paper. And this uh, basically gave like some simpler algorithms uh, for some of the things that were done in the earlier paper. Are there any questions about the model or the overall topic? So let's uh, jump right into the problem. So what did I mean by uh, minimizing number of trips? So here's a good example. So let's say I have N jobs that I want to do. Every job has a release time, which is the earliest time at which it can be done. Uh, in the general model, each job has a length. Um, each job also has a deadline. So you can think of these uh, windows of time as being the interval in which the job has to be done. And what do we have available to us? We have available to us a batching machine. And in the batching machine, uh, basically we decide whether the machine is on or off, right? So that's like scheduling a trip or not scheduling a trip. And whenever the machine is on, we say the machine is active, then the machine can perform up to B jobs in that time slot whenever it is active. And our goal is to minimize the number of trips. So we want to minimize the number of active slots. Does that make sense? So I'll show you by an example now, right? So here's a, a, an ex interesting example. So we are going to focus uh, for this first part of the talk on the case of unit jobs. So this is like uh, transporting passengers from an airport to downtown, uh, the length of each trip is the same. And so uh, what are we looking for? We're looking for a schedule when the machine is on. So these pink columns are sort of showing you when we decided to turn the machine on. The batch capacity is three. And notice that we were able to schedule three jobs in each of the, well, in the first two time slots, we scheduled three jobs in each time slot. So that is uh, utilizing the machine to full capacity. Notice that each job also is scheduled within its release time and deadline. But then we needed four active slots, even though there were nine jobs and the batch size was three, uh, we cannot uh, finish the schedule in, in three time slots because of the deadline constraints of this uh, pink job up here. So in this time slot, only one job is being done and then the next time slot, two slots are being done. So we don't utilize the machine optimally in, to some degree, but that's because of the deadlines and release time constraints. So uh, without further ado, uh, let me talk about the actual algorithm. I think the uh, model hopefully is clear. Any questions, feel free to interrupt. So we can also think of this, uh, sorry, go ahead, there's a question. Uh, yeah, Professor. So um, just to be clear about the model, uh, we are not trying to optimize the deadline in any way, right? It's just a constraint in the optimization. Right? Correct. Yeah, yeah. So the deadline is only a constraint. So, so in some of the more recent work we've been, I will come back to that point in a minute, but for, for now, you can just assume the deadline is a hard constraint, right? So uh, there's also a classical problem called set cover. And I just wanted to point out that for those of you who've seen the definition of set cover, there is sort of a relationship between this problem and set cover. So in set cover, you basically have an abstract collection of elements and you have collection of sets and you're trying to choose some sets uh, to uh, cover all the elements. So if you think of every column here of time, corresponding time, you can think of it as a set and picking a column corresponds to choosing a set and the elements that belong to the set are obviously the windows of time that overlap. Those are the jobs that could have been scheduled possibly in that time slot. And uh, each column now has a capacity. So it is not unbounded capacity. In normal set cover, when you pick a set, you cover all the elements that the set contains. But here there's a bound B as to how many elements you can cover and you have to decide which elements to cover. Okay. So just for those of you who are familiar with that. So 
In the set cover model, actually, uh, a long time ago, 1982, now I guess 40 years ago, Woolsey gave a greedy algorithm with a log n approximation. So that problem is NP hard. But as it turns out, our problem has so much structure that actually our problem is not going to be NP hard and they're going to show an optimal uh, strategy. There was already an optimal strategy published in 2008 using dynamic programming uh, by Evan, Levy, Robert, Schieber, Shahar, and Sviridenko. And they gave an exact algorithm based on dynamic programming. But as you can see, the running time of the algorithm was relatively high. Okay, So it is like n squared multiplied by t squared multiplied by n plus t. So n here is the number of jobs. t is sort of the maximum deadline, the window over which you're trying to schedule things. And so this uh, algorithm is a polynomial algorithm, but its complexity is something like n to the power of 5, roughly, assuming that t and n are roughly the same magnitude. So that's not a very practical algorithm. Even if I give you 1,000 jobs, 1,000 to the power of 5 is a very big number. Right? So our uh, main question was, uh, can we solve this problem uh, exactly? And so I'm going to show you a very, very simple algorithm uh, now to solve this problem. And the uh, motivation of the algorithm is something that we call lazy activation. So lazy activation says, why should I turn the machine on unless I really have to? So if you look at this instance, our basic goal should be, let's worry about the the, dead, the job of the first deadline. And there's no real advantage in term doing this job aggressively too early. Because if I delay doing this job, then we can maximally overlap it with other jobs. So basically, our strategy is to try to do the job as late as possible. Okay. So, and then when I do this job, then there are other potential jobs that we could also do. Like, of course, if I decide to turn the machine on, the batch capacity is B. So I can do B minus one other jobs at the same time. And we basically show that a very simple greedy rule is optimal. And the greedy rule is to, among all of the jobs that are available, pick the B minus one with the earliest deadlines in the future. Okay, so the, that's the basic strategy. It turns out that that strategy actually does not work. So the reason the strategy does not work is sort of because of overcrowding. So you might delay this job as much as possible and, and do it here. And you might even do B minus one other jobs, right? But let's say there's another job whose deadline is in the next time slot. But maybe there is even uh, like uh, 10 times B as many jobs with that deadline. So then you'll get stuck because you can only do B of them. That means that you schedule this job too late. You have to go back and make changes. And in fact, we first uh, designed an algorithm, which was uh, based on an iterative strategy where every time I ran into trouble, we would actually go back and change the prior schedule. So the algorithm was slow and also the proof of correctness was actually quite involved. So, uh, but later on, we simplified our algorithm considerably. And here's the idea behind the simplification. So this is a paper that was actually published uh, prior to the 2014 paper. Uh, this is uh, joint work with Hal Gebo, uh, Jessica and myself. And uh, this is the lazy activation. And in this uh, model, basically what we uh, did was the following. What we're going to do is to think about how many jobs may have the same deadline. If there are more than B jobs with the same deadline, we want to pre-process the input so that at most B jobs have the same deadline. Okay, Because the problem that I described earlier that we were running into is only when you have more than B jobs with a common deadline. So, what, so let's take a simple example. Let's say B is 3. So I have this collection of jobs. All of them have this uh, common deadline. right? But now notice that in the last time slot, only B jobs can anyway be done. right? There's no advantage in having five jobs have that deadline and doing all five jobs there. They can never fit there in any optimum schedule. So basically what we do is we adjust the deadlines of the jobs that were released the earliest. So in this case, B is three. So we want the property that at most B jobs have, the co have a common deadline. So we let those three jobs that were released later uh, not make any changes to them. And we artificially change the deadline of the jobs that were released first. And because here there were five jobs, and B is three, there were two excess jobs over B. And then we uh, reduce uh, their deadline by one. Because anyway, without loss of generality, I cannot do more than three jobs in the last slot. And we are able to prove that without loss of generality, they should be the jobs that were released latest. Now notice that this may cause another problem, right? Maybe in the previous time slot, there were earlier two jobs uh, with that deadline. But now once I made the change of these two jobs with this deadline, now suddenly there are four jobs with that deadline here. So we will apply this uh, strategy from right to left uh, recursively. So now if there are four jobs. Again, we will ask the question, which are the three with the latest release time? Let them be. And then for the other, subtract one from the deadline. And so that's our pre-processing from right to left. 
And as we do a sweep over all the jobs, we ensure this pro property that there are at most B jobs with a common deadline. Any questions? So the value of uh, this uh, scan is that then our greedy strategy will never uh, get into trouble. So after we've done this pre-processing step, now we simply order jobs by deadlines, <clears throat> left to right. And now we basically take the job with the latest deadline, schedule it, and then we have capacity P minus one, and then we fill that capacity picking the, using an earliest deadline first rule. So that's the entire algorithm. So uh, do you want to see an example or is it clear? So this is an example of step two after we've done the pre-processing. Yes, question. Um, so here we were assuming that we'll have enough slots, but what about like if all five of them begin at the same time and you have an option of only three, how do you deal with something like that? Yeah, so I, I, that's a very good question. And I was sort of surprised nobody asked this question. So this pre-processing step might actually have the effect. Like if you imagine that, uh, let's say that uh, all the release times and deadlines were gave you length one in, in windows, right? And obviously you cannot schedule five jobs in the same time slot. Basically what this pre-processing will, will do is a few of these windows might collapse to nothing. Like the release time might become equal to deadline. So we, we will address that uh, question in a second. So, but that basically implies that the input instance was not schedulable. There was no feasible schedule, okay? So, uh, so basically here, let's say we've done the pre-processing. So this is an example of step two. So I first do a, I've already done the pre-processing. So I make sure there are no more than B jobs with a common deadline. And now we simply pick the job with the earliest deadline, schedule this there. And now among all remaining jobs, I pick B minus one, uh, which is B minus one is two, pick two jobs uh, with the earliest deadline, schedule them and then remove them from the instance. And now apply the rule recursively, schedule this job, schedule two more, remove them, schedule this job, schedule two more, remove them, okay? And now there's a series of properties that we have to prove for the optimality of this algorithm. But let me come to the main question that was just asked. So what happens uh, in this example, let's say uh, B is still three, but we have a very large number of jobs, more than six that have to be scheduled in these two time slots. So here, what will happen is that as you modify the deadlines of the bottom two jobs, right? You will leave the top three jobs alone. Then the bottom two jobs, the deadline will modify. And now you have four jobs of length one windows. And now one of them will have its window reduced to nothing. So that just means that there was no uh, feasible solution. But what is interesting is that we can formally prove that even if the input instance is infeasible, our algorithm will actually do the largest number of jobs that can be done in any possible schedule. So the number of jobs that we do not do is the best possible among all possible scheduling strategies, right? So if I, let's say given thousand jobs, I schedule 990 of them. That means there is no schedule that can do more than 990. So 10 jobs got dropped. And moreover, there is no schedule that can do any subset of 990 jobs in less time, uh, less number of active slots. Okay, so it's optimal in sort of two ways. Okay. So uh, now uh, let me mention a couple of interesting generalizations, which is sort of the focus of our work now. So there's a, a issue here, which is that while we focus on optimizing the number of trips, we kind of completely ignore the customer waiting times. Right. So the customer waiting times uh, were completely ignored and some customers who arrived early might actually wait a very long time. And just because they said, okay, I'm flexible, I can wait a long time, then they'll be sort of be forced to wait a long time. So we are sort of uh, studying the trade-off between uh, the energy usage and what is called flow time. So what is flow time of a job? A flow time is simply how long the job was in the system waiting for service. So if a job is scheduled at time 100, but arrived at time 80, then the flow time of that job is 20. Basically it was in the system for 20 units of time while it was waiting. If a job was serviced immediately upon arrival, let's say it arrived at time 10 and was finished by time 11, then it's uh, flow time is one because it had basically zero waiting time. So flow time is simply the difference between the completion time and the release time. So our basic uh, current uh, work is on the problem. This is with uh, a postdoc Samantha Davies and an undergraduate student Shirley Zhang which is simply given a budget on active time, how do we minimize the average waiting time? So we have uh, some new results. So for one thing, we can show that this problem can also be solved optimally in polynomial time. And uh, the algorithm is not very efficient right now. So it is a uh, high, high running time. Uh, the case that we can solve efficiently is what we call when the deadlines are agreeable. 
So what agreeable intuitively means is that uh, if, if a job arrives uh, later than some other job, then its deadline is also later compared to that job. Right? So basically, let, uh, if you look at the ordering of jobs by release time, and you look at the ordering of the jobs by deadline, these two orderings are identical. This was not true in the uh, input, uh, in the case I showed you earlier. So in the case where the, uh, what we call the jobs have uh, agreeable deadlines, then we can, we have an efficient algorithm, uh, but the algorithm is not as efficient when the jobs have general deadlines. So, but that's obviously the subject for the talk and if interested, I can, I can send you a video. Shirley gave a short presentation on some of our work, a uh, 15 minute talk uh, recently. So I probably have access to that video if you are interested. Okay. So let me talk a little bit now about non-unit length jobs. So this was actually one of the main focus of the, of the paper with uh, Coel and Jessica, which was uh, arbitrary length jobs. So by arbitrary length jobs, what I mean is that the job might uh, require multiple units of processing. So it is a little bit different from uh, the, the shipping model or the trucking model. So a job may have a release time and a deadline, but it also has some amount of processing that needs to happen. In one case, the processing is happening in an uninterrupted way. So like, for example, in the example on the left, B is two, so the machine can be doing two jobs at any point of time, but once a job is started, it runs to completion. Right? And that will cause you some amount of active time, which is the time that you're maybe renting cloud services to pay for running the jobs. Now, on the, on the model on the right, you're allowed preemption for free. And here, notice that we can reduce the active time. Basically, if preemption means that I can interrupt the job, stop it, and then resume processing later. So the job still gets the same amount of processing that it is, needs, but it doesn't have to be done continuously. Does that make sense? So, uh, and these two models behave quite differently. So for example, in the non-preemptive model, it was uh, actually very easy to show that the problem is NP hard. In the preemptive model, uh, at least when we did the work initially, uh, we did not know what the complexity was, but very recently this problem has also been shown to be NP hard. So I need to actually update the slide. Okay. So uh, now what is the relationship? Uh, I mentioned in the abstract a relationship with certain combinatorial problems. So uh, here's a question for you all. How many of you are familiar with this problem called max flow? Uh, anybody of you familiar with this problem called max flow? Because this part of the talk might not make any sense if you've never seen this max flow problem before. Any thoughts? Samir, they would intuitively know it. So maybe you can just explain in sort of- Okay, okay. so so okay. So maybe I'll now uh, start talking a little bit in high level to give you some intuition as to what is going on, right? So the maximum flow problem, so forget everything I mentioned about scheduling. So what is the maximum flow problem? It's a, it's a graph problem. Uh, so maximum flow problem, in fact, uh, Subhashish, you probably know Maheshwari well, Sachin Maheshwari. He of actually course, he wrote had, one of he the- actually, He actually taught me max flows. And also he wrote code. one of the classical papers on match flow. So yeah, he's a co-author. The three Indian, the three the... Indian algorithm. Correct, correct, correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he wrote, he's the co-author of one of the papers on match flow. The other co-author, Malotra, by the way, was my undergraduate project advisor in IIT Kanpur. Uh -huh. But he was always really shy about his work. So he never told us about it. You know, one time I was just reading a book and I came across his name. So I actually pointedly asked him, is this... Actually, my he initially, he, when he teaches flow, he never teaches his own algorithm. He never? For some reason. Well, no. I teach their algorithm because I really like it. Yeah. <laughs> I really like their algorithm. Yeah. It's very, very clever. So uh, yes. basically what I wanted to say about max flow is that it's a, it's a network problem. So think about a, a fluid network with a source and a sink. So here the source is node S, uh, T is the sink. This is, a, let's say, a directed graph. Every link in this graph has some capacity. So capacity just refers to how much flow can go on this arc. And nodes inside the network cannot uh, generate flow or absorb flow. So the amount of flow that enters any node in the network is equal to the amount of flow that leaves the network, except for the source and the sink. So source generates flow, sink absorbs flow, every other node is uh, flow is conserved. And the goal is simply how do I send the maximum amount of flow from the source to sink? And this was a classical problem, very well studied in the, in the 70s. Uh, there were a variety of different algorithms uh, given by Edmonds and Karp in the 70s. Uh, they were not as fast. And so uh, maybe I try to remember, maybe in the late 70s, uh, they were 
two algorithms proposed. One was by Marotra Kumar and Maheshwari, uh, and there was another algorithm proposed by Karzanov. And I think both of the algorithms uh, use slightly different approach, but they actually gave the same running time, which was cubic in the number of vertices of the graph. So there were n cube uh, running time algorithms. Subsequently, Slater and Tarjan made clever use of a data structure called dynamic trees and gave algorithms that were faster for sparse graphs. And they ran in something like number of nodes multiplied by number of edges multiplied by log function. So for sparse graphs, they're faster, but for dense graphs, they're not any faster. So, so those were the algorithms uh, developed uh, subsequently. And now there are even some other uh, improved algorithms, I think, based on some different uh, continuous math tools uh, done by, um, I think, a guy called Dan Spielman at Yale and Alex Madri. So uh, the basic thing about flow is that there is a, let's say, a reasonably fast polynomial algorithm. It's not linear time or anything yet. Uh, but now, what is the relationship with flow? So maybe at the high level, I will sort of show you the relationship with flow. So the way we utilize uh, flow algorithms is I think of each job as being a node in this graph. I think of every time slot as being a green node in this graph. Okay? And then uh, the time slots and the jobs clearly have a natural relationship. So if a job can be done in time slots one, two, and three, we put edges from that job node to time slot one node, time slot two node, time slot three node, and so on. right? And the edge capacities from the source node to the job nodes, the purple nodes, is simply equal to the length of the job. So if this job needs uh, two units of processing, it means that two units of flow might reach this node and then somehow has to be sent along the edges going out of it into one of these three nodes. And which edge you send flow on is like trying to decide if I want to schedule one unit of the job in that time slot or not. Okay. Now there's some differences with the max flow problem, right? So the max flow problem just maximizes flow and will tell you how to find a feasible schedule subject to the constraint that at most B jobs are done in every time slot because I will impose a capacity function of B on the edges going from time slots nodes uh, to the sink. Okay. Now, the reason that our problem is a little bit trickier is that there's a concept of open slots and non-open slots. So if the slots in dark green are open, that means these bold edges going to the sink have a capacity of B because I have decided to open the slot and run the machine so I can schedule up to B jobs. If the slot is in light green, then in some sense, we have decided not to open the slot. And so the capacity of that edge is actually zero. So what is the game that we are trying to play? The game that we are trying to play is that, of course, every edge may have capacity B, but we want to minimize the number of edges with non-zero capacity, right? Because zero capacity means that slot is idle and I don't have to pay for it. But once I decide to turn the machine on, I have to pay for that slot, whether I schedule one job or I schedule P jobs. It doesn't matter. I still have to pay for it. So the game is now that we know what is the total sum of processing times of all the jobs. So we kind of know how much flow is coming from the S to these nodes. But we have to find a way to dissipate that flow to the sink by turning on as few nodes in, in dark green as possible. So that's what we're trying to optimize. And every time I make a node dark green, I get capacity B going to the sink. And we want to choose the right set of nodes so that all of the flow will go and we minimize the number of green nodes that we pick. So that's the basic problem and the relationship with flow. Okay, any questions? So basically this leads to our algorithm also. So in the next slide, I will now show you our algorithm. So we use basically flow as a way to translate between a job assignment or not, right? So if somebody already told me which slots were active and which slots are inactive, then the problem is solved. Then I can just find a max flow and that will give me the assignment of when a job should be done. And it will come up with a non pre with, it'll come up with a preemptive schedule because there is no guarantee that a flow of say two units that reaches this node will go to two contiguous slots in the next layer. So it might go to time slot one, it might go to time slot three. We have no control over the schedule. So the output schedule will be a preemptive schedule, not a non-preemptive schedule. So basically now this leads to our algorithm that we call uh, finding minimal feasible solutions. So what our algorithm does is imagine that we turn on all of these time slot nodes. So everything is dark green. So I get a capacity of B on every edge. And now I say, what is the max flow value in this graph? If you tell me the max flow value is the sum of the job lengths, then we know that the input instance is schedulable. All of the flow that reaches the purple nodes can be sent onto the sink. But so far we turned on all the green nodes, right? Every, every edge has capacity B. 
So now the amazing thing is that the algorithm is actually quite blind. So I can take any time slot and turn it off, meaning that I will make it inactive and force the edge to have zero capacity. Once I force the edge to have zero capacity, then we can ask the question, what is the value of the max flow after I've made that decision? If the max flow remains unchanged, that means the flow can find its way to the sink. It can be rerouted. Okay. So that's our entire algorithm. So basically at every time step, I keep trying to turn nodes off. And if turning the node off or making the edge capacity zero still maintains the maximum flow value without changing it, we will make a permanent decision to turning that node off. And the beauty of this is you can do this in any order you want. Okay. So now what can we prove? If you do this in any order that you want, basically we can prove that this is an approximation algorithm, right? So finding the optimum solution now we know is NP hard, but what we can prove is that the quality of the solution found for this algorithm is no worse than three times optimal. So it may open more slots than necessary, but not more than three times the optimal number of slots. Okay. And so uh, this uh, took us some time to prove, right? And, and this, okay, so here's, I guess, an example of the algorithm. So these are different uh, windows of times with release times, deadlines, and the number on the right indicates the length of the job that has to be processed. So every job has some amount of processing it needs. These jobs are very flexible. They only need one unit of processing, uh, but the windows are quite long. These jobs are very rigid. They need four units of processing each, and the windows are only of length four, and so on and so forth. And P is five. So what is sort of, um, and I, I think this is an optimum schedule, right? This is an optimum schedule, I think, yeah. So in this optimum schedule, our cost, as you can see, is quite low and every active time slot is pretty saturated. So we lined up these uh, four jobs here and uh, did them all together. And then this is sort of the cost of the schedule, right? These jobs we have no choice about and so on and so forth. But where can our approach go wrong? The reason our approach can go wrong is if you would try to shut down this time slot, the last time slot here, it is an okay decision to shut it down. Right? The flow can still re be rerouted if you decide to shut down this time, last time slot. Why? Because all of the flow that was going here is now shifted to this side. All these nodes that were scheduled in the last time slot can still be done here. Notice that in any vertical column, we are doing at most five jobs. So this is still a feasible solution and our algorithm will could make a mistake and shut down the last time slot. But there's a very high penalty in doing so. So that's what I was trying to show is that this minimal feasible solution may have a, actually a cost twice as much as the optimum solution. Now, what is interesting is that, uh, so this was uh, after we proved this and then maybe I'll skip over the proof. The proof is somewhat technical. So there is a sort of a series of lemmas that we have to prove uh, to prove this bound of three. And uh, but what I just mainly wanted to mention was a more recent result by mm -hmm. Kumar and myself, where basically, uh, let me go back and uh, illustrate the algorithm. So basically what we do is we show that if you did the shutting down of slots in some ordered manner, let's say left to right. So rather than shutting down any slot at any point of time, you just did it left to right. So that already gives you a two approximation. So there's a way to improve the algorithm and the way to improve it is simply to shut down the uh, slots left to right. So we don't know of any better algorithm right now. So we know the problem is NP hard. Uh, we have a polynomial algorithm which uses flows and this algorithm will shut down slots left to right. And every time making a decision to close a slot does not impact the max flow value, you make a permanent decision to close it and carry on. And that's the entire algorithm. And we can prove that that is a two approximation. Uh, I, th I don't think two is the right answer. I think you can do better than two, but I don't know how to do so. So let me maybe uh, pause and maybe talk a little bit about some other uh, related problems. So again, I will not go into technical details, but just give maybe tell you a little bit about what is the busy time problem. So the busy time problem is a non preemptive version of what I was just describing to you. So here jobs cannot be preempted. You basically have jobs that you want to do. And so let's say here are jobs that you want to do, but the jobs cannot be preempted. So what I'm showing you here is the length of the job. Uh, let's say of this middle job is something like 10. Uh, this job has length five, this job has length six, this job has length eight, the jobs have windows of time. 
and so on and so forth. And what is our goal? Our goal is to group these jobs into bundles. So as you can see, I have grouped these jobs now into two bundles. Each bundle has the property that at most three jobs are active within the bundle. And what is the total cost of the schedule? It's the total sum of the lengths of the bundles, right? So this bundle has length 10, which means that even though we are not utilizing all three machines, we are paying for them for 10 units of time. So it's like renting cloud computing services, right? So you rent a machine on the cloud, or you are running three jobs, uh, but of course the machine is not perfectly utilized, but you have to pay for renting the machine. So you have to pay for 10 units of time. These other jobs, you pay eight units of time by doing the right set of overlapping. So basically people are, let's say you are a big company, uh, many internal uh, groups in the company have cloud computing needs, and you are trying to be this middleman where you're trying to decide how to minimize the cost of scheduling all of these jobs that you need to run by paying Amazon less money, basically, right? So that's sort of what leads to the busy time model. And so the basic things uh, we, we have been able to show is that this busy time problem, which was known to be NP-HAR, it's a non-preemptive model, uh, we can develop algorithms uh, which are like a factor three approximation. So we can find schedules where the total busy time is no more than three times optimal. And I mean, these algorithms are not super efficient. I mean, they use dynamic programming and a greedy algorithm. So the dynamic programming part is the part that's inefficient. The greedy part is reasonably efficient. Uh, so that's where things are right now. And this problem was well studied for a very special case in the past called interval jobs. So the difference between the general busy time problem and this interval job problem is that in interval jobs that you cannot move jobs left to right. So the processing time of the job is exactly the distance between release time and deadline. So there's no left to right choice allowed. The only thing that you're allowed to do is to change the grouping of the jobs. So you ca I cannot move them left to right anymore. I can only decide what the grouping is. Okay. And so obviously, uh, if you cannot move the jobs left to right, then the grouping could be different and might have you a, a more expensive cost. Uh, and this problem is slightly easier to solve when you cannot move things uh, left and right. So this problem actually has a two approximation, which we were unable to get for the general problem so far. So let me uh, uh, stop here because I think there's a pretty technical part of the talk. And uh, let's see, I was just wanted to maybe get to one uh, last slide. Okay. so. I mentioned earlier that these uh, preemptive active time scheduling problem, at least when we did the work, we were not able to prove it was NP complete. Uh, but recently two people at Google, uh, Saha and a former student of mine, Manish Purohit, uh, in an archive paper last year, proved that the problem is NP complete. The busy time problem that I mentioned, um, I right now all we can do is a factor of three approximation. I think the right answer for that problem is again two. We also uh, did some work on online algorithms. Uh, this was published in a paper in Wars 2017. And also there's a group at uh, in uh, Nanyang Technological University in Singapore that has been doing some work in online algorithms or busy time problem. So they all had a paper in SPAR 2017 and maybe a paper I think in SPAR 2019 as well, also uh, like on more general models. And of course, uh, depends on the algorithm. I talked about a variety of different algorithms in the talk. Uh, some of them are fast, some of them are slow. So I think getting efficient algorithms for all of these problems in my mind is an interesting uh, interesting goal. And so I just wanted to quickly mention some of the papers that are related to this uh, talk that I cited. This uh, reference slide is actually not completely up to date. So certainly the work with Sammy Davies and Shirley is not published yet, so that's not here. But also Frederick Kohler and I had a follow paper in 2017 that's not cited here. Uh, but otherwise this slide I think covers uh, most of the related literature. Uh, in this talk. So let me maybe uh, stop sharing and take questions now. Any thoughts or questions? Okay, so Samita, maybe I, so um, 
you know, how would uh, this uh, approximations in the approximation boundary is a little low when you try to prove it? But uh, if you execute it with a pure greedy approach, how would they compare actually? These are the problems. So in, in general, I would say uh, the greedy approaches do very well, right? So for most of these problems, if you employ, so the first algorithm I talked about was basically a purely greedy algorithm anyway. Uh, but for the approximation versions, I think in general, for most practical instances, greedy does very well. All I'll say is that in the busy time model, um, th there's sort of two, two parts of our algorithm and I didn't get a chance to talk about it. But the first part is like a dynamic programming part, which assumes that B is infinity and tries to group jobs in a way that uh, minimizes projection onto the x-axis. So that part is actually somewhat slow because the dynamic programming has high space complexity and oh, right time complexity. Okay. But after the dynamic programming is done, our algorithm is actually a greedy algorithm. Greedy, yeah. Yeah, so, so the second phase of the algorithm is a purely greedy algorithm because the dynamic programming part, once you fix the jobs, it sort of becomes like an interval job instance. And so that becomes easier to schedule. And then we basically have a clever greedy strategy for doing the schedule. So I would say while the technical work is improving the bounds, the algorithm is actually a greedy algorithm, but it is not one that you might immediately think of if you were not trying mm -hmm. to also get an approximation guarantee. So I would say in the... In the um, in the end, right? Usually, most of the greedy heuristics that we come up with, if we are not trying to prove uh, formally bounds on the performance of the algorithm, in practice, most of those greedy algorithms do quite well. So, the main way to think about the mathematics behind approximation algorithms is, in a way, it forces you to try to come up with alternative strategies that you can analyze, and some of those strategies give rise to new greedy algorithms that you might not might not have thought of. So our algorithm in the end, like I said, is a purely greedy strategy, but it is not a sort of most, it's not like greedy strategy zero that you would think of. <laughs> you yeah. have to do some extra work. And then once you see the strategy, you understand how it is trying to overcome some of the hurdles, right? So basically I'll say is that if I compare our final greedy strategy to a more naive greedy strategy, maybe in 90% of the instances, their behavior might even be identical, but there are some instances uh, which the normal greedy algorithm that we first came up with was doing very poorly. And that's sort of what motivated the new algorithm. So there will be some cases when the new algorithm will perform better and vice versa. There could be other cases in which the first naive strategy will do better, right? So that is the issue with heuristics. It's very hard to uh, predict in advance. So there are even some uh, machine learning people now who created these amazing SAT solvers. I don't know how well you know that yes. literature, but they did these SAT solvers, which were trained. Yeah, I, know Sharad, I, I, I know the original Sharad Malik trick for the SAT solver. Right. Okay, okay. But but there's now like these ML-based tools. So what they do yeah. is they train on a lot of input data. And so they're able to look at a, a, SAT, a SAT formula and they're able to predict which solver will do better on it. Like, so you may have six, seven competing solvers but these prediction strategies look at the formula and tell you which solver to use actually. And they won the Goodness. international competition without coming up with any new solver. So they took existing solvers, they trained them. And so if, if you came up with solver one and I came up with solver two and somebody else came up with solver three, right? These people took the solvers published in the previous year, trained the solvers on instances in advance. And then they came up with basically a prediction model which said for this input run this solver. It was kind of mind blowing, but they basically beat the pants off the next year just by using older solvers. And then they were wow. basically that kind of submission was made illegal the following year because they didn't come up with any new solver. They just said, we'll apply machine learning. We will use these existing solvers and they beat everybody. Right. And so then explicitly the following year in the competition, this approach was barred, but still they showed something interesting, which is that yeah. machine learning can yeah. help you a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll get the references from you. I think Devan also yeah. had a question. He's put yeah, so in I mean, chat. in terms Devine. of uh, starting to learn about this, I would say, I mean, if you're familiar with the kleinberg Tardosh book, it's an excellent mm -hmm. new textbook on algorithms. I would say that's a very good starting point. So once you have read the kleinberg Tardosh textbook, then maybe making the transition to research papers is uh, relatively easy. And the paper that uh, I had published with uh, Jessica and Coyle, um, uh, in 2014 SPA, that's pretty, at least half of the paper is pretty easy to read. Half of it is technical. So, I mean, you can obviously look at the paper and see that different sections and 
start reading them and whichever ones you like, you're welcome to sort of explore those in more detail. Veda? Professor, one of the students asked me to ask you to drop the name of the book. They didn't catch it properly. Oh, okay, sure. Lineberg et Ardus, right. Yeah, it's a standard textbook on algorithms now. It came out maybe, I think, 15 years ago. Yeah. So? Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I missed uh, this as a part of the talk, but uh, in the first half of the talk, when we were discussing the energy efficient scheduling algorithms, um, so what the algorithm is guaranteeing is that we'll have the optimum number of slots, but is it also guaranteeing that given that number of slots, my waiting time is also optimized or is that not a guarantee? No, no. And is there any way so we can... there's no, so that's the more recent work that I mentioned of flow time. So now we are basically trying to analyze flow time. Uh, so, but the strategies are quite different. I mean, the strategies are not, are right now they're mostly based on dynamic programming. And like I said, for agreeable deadlines, our strategy is efficient, but for not agreeable deadlines, right now the running time is very high, something like n to the power seven or something like that. So it's not at all a practical algorithm right now. But I think more work will need to be done because I don't think it's that hard a problem actually. Yeah, but again, as uh, Subhashi said, uh, maybe there are heuristics that do very well. And so that would be interesting too. Like if there's a very fast algorithm that gives you a solution close to optimal, maybe that's good enough. Anybody else? I'll be reachable by email. So if anybody has any questions, you can feel free to shoot me an email. I probably have to get ready and go to work now because I have meetings there starting uh, right. at, at 10. That's so, why I said I'll give a talk for 45 minutes or so so I can get ready and take off. All right. So thanks, Samir. And I'll, yeah, yeah. I'll, good I'll, seeing I'll... all of you. Enjoy the rest of your evening and dinner. Yeah. Okay. Thank bye. you. Thank you, Professor, for this talk. And um, it was a great session and uh, we hope to see you sometime in person at Ashoka when things open up. Yeah, I'll be happy to. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.